Welcome to Go on the Run. And in this video, I want to look at anonymous functions and closures. Now, depending on your background, if this is your first time in Go and your first programming language, then this may not be confusing for you. But if you come from another language like C or C++, where there's no closure, well, C++ today has some Lambda functions, but and again, as you can see already, Lambda, Clojure, all these things, they just sort of, they could be a little bit confusion. Or a language like Scala, or even the Clojure language with a J. Um, you might be a little bit confused as to what are anonymous functions in Go and what are closures in Go. And this is the concept or a certain idea or a certain way of writing code. Now, or rather, it's a feature that's supported in some programming language. Like I said, language like C does not have closure. So what is it and how can you tell the difference if there is a difference? And so let's jump in. So I will start with this rather simple program here. So I am in my go on the run directory and I have a directory created called anonymous functions and closures. And I've already opened my Visual Studio Code editor and I've written some simple code. So this is just a main function calling the function call get work to do later. Yes, very verbose. And as you can see, get work to do later is just a function with two statements. There's a both a funct statement. One prints entering get work to do later called, and the other defers a statement that would be run after this function terminate. But this is important. The defer statement runs after the function ends. So it's only after all the statements in the function complete and the function is about to be terminated, then the go run time will check and see if there were defer statements and run those in reverse. And that would be after every other statement in the function complete. Okay. So with that said now, we can, we know it's how if we run this, what we will see. And, and no surprise, this is what we get. But I want to do something else. Remember this function is get work to do later. So what I would really like is for me to call this function and it returns something that I can execute later. So at the time when I call this function is now when the work would be done, but it's after I call this function. So, so first I've added a function do work. Now oh, this is all it's gonna do. This is the work I wanna do later. My get work to do later will return this function. Notice it's using just the function name as the return value and since get work to do later returns a value we have to correct this by putting a return type and so we can see that get work to do later returns a function that takes no parameter and has no return value and this is exactly and this matches the signature for do work because do work is a function that does not take any parameter and doesn't return a value and so we can return that in. so Everything is good and peachy and I do not have an error. It will look very similar to the output I got before. Now, my function here, get work to do later, is returning a value, but I'm not saving that value. So I can do that. And so if I save that in, let's say F, for example, I need to do something with it. And what I can do is I can call the function that is returned. So this represent me calling F or do work at a much later time. So I could have done many other things um, between what I call get work to do later and when I call the function to actually do the work. And we should expect to see do work call. And there you go. Now so far I haven't shown you anything groundbreaking. This this is very, very simple, hopefully. I have two functions, they're both named functions. And I simply use one function to return the name of the other function. Okay, or you can think of it as a reference of the other function. And then I would, since I have that return, I can call that function later. Now notice for main, it really doesn't need to know the name or the actual name of this function, even though this is the name function. It used something totally different to invoke that work. So we can say, that, you know what, this doesn't need to be a name function. It can be an anonymous function. So now I'm looking at exercise two and we have pretty much exact same code we had before. No change whatsoever, except 
like to quote the two lines of comment that I had between here, just to make things shorter because you understand the concept when I say that oh, there can be some time pass between when I get a reference to this function and when I call the function. Okay, so now we can do something like I said, we can make this function anonymous because we don't really need to, we have not used this function do work by name except within the get work to do later function. Nowhere else are we using this name do work. This is the only place where we use this, this name. So why not move it into here? Well, this is our error. As you can see, what we have is a name function within a name function. Something like this is allowed in certain languages. And for example, Dart programming language, you can do this, or even JavaScript, you can have function within function. And, but in Go, we do not allow named function within named functions. So we only allow an anonymous function. So the way we make an anonymous function is we simply remove the name from between the fun keyword and the parameter list. And that is why we have an anonymous function. Anonymous here is because what I have is a function without a name. That's why it's anonymous. I don't know what the name of this function is. It doesn't have one. It wasn't given one. But I still have reference or access to it by the fact that I've assigned the value, the memory address, if you want to think of it that way, of where this function definition lives in memory. I have assigned that to a variable, and now I can use that variable to return access or the location to this function and so therefore it can be called and so this should work exactly as we had before and so let's run it and notice how it looks exactly the same we get the exact same result even though here we use an anonymous and since it's an anonymous function i can use any variable name i or i like and i can even make things more compact though i would not advise it i usually like assigning my anonymous function to a variable and then if I have to return the variable or whatever, I use it that way. To me, it's clearer. You, if you can, though, if you want, you can do this. You can, for example, just simply return the anonymous function like this. Now, the code is a little bit shorter, but I find this a little bit harder to read. And so I always prefer readability than doing something clever or something like that. No, I do want shorter code also. So there's that balance, and either you, your personal style, or your team might dictate what you should do. But this is also completely valid. As you can see, there's no error, and I'm just simply returning that function literal. Now, what's a function literal? Well, this is a function literal. It's when you, if you define a function as a value compared to when you have a named function. So this is function as a value. How do we know it's a function as a value? Because the only thing you can return from functions are values. And the only thing you can assign to our variables are values. So that's what we had before when we had a anonymous function. So an anonymous function and function literal are one and the same. So here I am in exercise three, and it looks exactly like exercise two. I haven't changed anything. But what I can do is I can say that this function takes a parameter. Now, what are we gonna do with x? Well, we can say that work was called to let's say, you know, double x. Now we have an error, but let's just focus on what we're doing here. We have func, which is of type, is a function that takes an integer parameter and return is to return two times x, which means now our function not only takes a parameter, but also returns a value of type int. Well, the reason why we have this error message is because if you look at the signature of the function, the value we're returning, it just simply says the value is a func that doesn't take any parameter and returns nothing. Well, we know that's not true. It actually takes an int and it returns an int. Now, the problem here is not in the value we save. That's okay. It's when we go to call our function. Remember, we're going to call it later. So, we need to call it with a value. So our parameter here, let's call it with four to do some work with this value four. And what we should see is once we, when we call it, it just said do work call to double four in our case. And do work is returning a value of its own, the doubling of, um, 
our parameter, but we're not saving that. But of course, we can save it and also print it out. So we're calling our function, saving the return value from that function, and then we print it out. So we should expect is to work call to double four, and then we should get eight, and we're printing that out. So, and that is exactly what we get. As you can see, we call a function to get work to be done later, and then we're able to do that work with a parameter of four, and we got the expected result of eight. Again, so far, nothing hurt shaking at all. I mean, this is hopefully very straightforward. We're still using anonymous function. And all we have done is went from use anonymous function that takes no parameter and return values to anonymous function that takes parameter and return value. But still, all we're dealing with it was anonymous function. So let's change it and now introduce closure. And let's see what is really different from what we've been doing. So now we're looking at example four and is exactly what we had before except for the printout. I've changed it a little bit from what we had before, but it's the same thing. Uh, essentially here I had result of work. Now I'm saying f of four is equals to whatever the value is. And otherwise to that, my code here hasn't changed one bit. So let's introduce a variable to our get work to do later function. By that, all I mean is we're simply going to say that var b is equals to Let's say 11. Okay. This is a variable in our get work to do function. Not very interesting. What is interesting is that we can access this variable B inside of this function that literal or this anonymous function that we will return. Now let's see what we can do. We can say two times X plus B. And so our comment here can be double x plus you know this and this would be b so all right all i've done is use a variable that was in the scope of the function in which i define my anonymous function so we can see here that b is being used in do work now let's think about what this means Remember I said before that from the time we return a value or the anonymous function, we can use it much, much later. If we can use it much later, it means that once we return from this get work to do later function, whatever variables were defined in this function, we should expect them to be gone by then, be cleaned up, no longer available. And so if our do work, if our anonymous function here is using a variable that's defined in this get work to do later. It means that by the time we are ready to call this function, this variable B should be gone and should no longer exist. And we should have a problem trying to access it. Now you might think, well, it was just a simple int. So maybe it works, but this works for anything. And this is where the closure come in. So this is what people mean when they talk about closure. They simply mean, that an anonymous function or in a function, if it's a language like JavaScript or Dart that actually allowed you to have name function, it just means that a function that captures or references the variable from the enclosing scope. And so we can see that our function or anonymous function capture or still references a variable from the enclosing scope. So this is the enclosing scope. Okay. And this is what closure is. You can say it closes over this variable B. So the, ver the variable here that is the closure that makes this a closure is B. So what is really happening? Well, you can imagine that when we declare the variable B here, there is Golang runtime and garbage collector is tracking the use of this variable. And it says, oh, there's B that reference, which means how many things are referring to B? There's one. And that's in this main, I'll set it to one because B can be referenced within this function. Now, when we decide to write this anonymous function, the garbage collector in the go runtime notices that B is being used here. So it goes, ah, I need to update the reference count to B to say that oh, now there are two things referencing B. And this is behind the scene. I'm just giving you an illustration, right? And what happens is 
when we return from this function, the garbage collector sees, well, at the end of this function, well, I am no longer referring to this variable in this function anymore, so I can decrement the reference count. So at the end of this function, at the end of it, after it returns, you can think of the reference count on B as being one because it decremented from two to one. That's because it can no longer be referenced within the scope of this function. But remember, it can be referenced from this anonymous function. So because the reference count is one, the garbage collector will not free this variable B because there's still something that's referring to it. And so that's why when we come back here and we call this function, it still have access to that um, variable B. And this remains true even if we take this variable F and pass it around to a number of functions. And like I said, the time between when you call, you get this reference and when you call it, it could be a long time, long, very long time, okay? And it does not matter. It still will maintain that reference. And so we can expect now that when we run our code, it should still work. So let's go to the right correct directory and run it. And as you can see, it works perfectly fine. And like I said, this works exactly the same regardless of if the thing you were talking about is just a simple variable or a struct or something more complicated. And we can test that very quickly and very easily. Let's copy our code, paste it real quick. And let's do something more interesting by saying we have a struct. And let's call it, I don't know, set age or something like that. Okay, that's what it's doing. And I'll remove this because I don't want this to be confusing. It's just for illustration that I was doing that. All right, so let's see what are we missing? Why are we, oh, why are we still having an error? Let's see. So let's start with our anonymous function. And so we have font age uint8, and it returns a pointer to a person. And, oh, this is wrong. So yep, no addition or anything. We're simply returning b, which is a pointer to a person. And this demonstrates that we are closing over b, which was defined in our enclosing scope. Of course, we need to set the age of b. So we say b that age is equals to h. So there we go. And let's see what else. Oh, pointer. I put the address. Pointer, 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 pointer. All right. <laughs> All right. So there we go. And so we're saying that we're returning a pointer and this person was already defining our enclosing scope. And like I mentioned, it's the same thing that happens. We'll get a reference to B and because we close over B, the reference count will increase, which means that though it should stick around for however long we have a reference to this anonymous function that references B or closes over B and that's where closure comes from. And as you can see, it still works, which is what I said. It will work for any type of value, no matter if that value is simply an int or it's more complex because the concept remains the same. That if you close over a value, that the go runtime should maintain and keep that value alive and don't get rid of it because you have a reference to it. Even if the function that declared that value um, is gone, which we know this function is gone, doesn't exist anymore, which means B should equally have been cleaned up, but it's not. I know that's sounds repetitive. So one last thing I want to show you, and that's here. If you look at the Go language specification in function type, you'll see it says this, function literals are closure. Now, what is a function literal? 
a function literal represents an anonymous function. So that's why I say anonymous function, function literal, all in one and the same. And all you have is a fun keyword followed by the signature of that function. And then you have the body of the function, which is, for example, this guy here, where we have function. And this is the signature of it, this part, which is the parameter list and the return type. And then this is the body. That's an anonymous function. You could write this anywhere. It's just that we happen to save it into a variable because it's just a value. And I know you can use that value or that variable to call that anonymous function. But the key thing here is that function literals are closures. And it just so happens that they may refer to a variable defined in a surrounding function. Now I use in closing scope because that's how I think of it. You can think of surrounding function, but I consider it in closing scope. So that's it. Take care and thanks for your time. Have a great day. See you in the next video. Bye.